Okay, I think we should start. Uh, and sorry for being a few minutes late. We'll hopefully go a few minutes over if that's possible. I want to welcome everyone again to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, I'm Aaron David Miller, a vice president for New Initiatives, and I direct the Middle East program here. Uh, as you know, uh, most of you, the, the center is the living memorial to our 28th president, Woodrow Wilson, our only PhD president amidst a uh, uh, 43, some would say 44 different presidents who were mostly lawyers, uh, generals, and politicians, our only PhD president, and the only one also historical presidential trivia here who's, who's actually buried uh, by choice uh, in Washington, D.C. Wilson believed deeply, uh, he was a student uh, of, uh, of Congress in the power of scholarship and also believe deeply in the importance of breaking down the walls that separate government from the academy. And having spent almost 25 years in the former, I would tend to agree uh, with the late president that thinking before acting, and particularly in this combustible and volatile world, is uh, obviously, it's always been important and we get ourselves into big trouble when we don't think clearly about the consequences of what we do, particularly when it comes to the projection of military force before we actually do it. Um, and that's what the center, a bipartisan institution, um, does in the main. Deep scholarship, regional expertise, study of history and perspective and political culture. We, I like to say, deal with headlines um, because headlines are obviously relevant in our 24-7 breathless media world, but we also deal with trend lines. And the transition here, I think, is that the Kurdish issue, the Kurdish question, represents for the United States both a headline, in large part because of how important the Kurds are, both to stability in Syria and, frankly, and, and I hope Dr. Cream will get into this, uh, and to U.S. policy, but also a trend line because Kurdish nationalism, unrequited, will remain a vibrant and dynamic factor in any Middle Eastern equation, including with respect to the stability and future of Turkey, a NATO ally. So it's an honor, Dr. Kareem, and we're delighted truly that you are here. Um, I also want to mention, introduce um, Amy Austin Holmes, who's a fellow and a professor of sociology at AUC, American University in Cairo. Amy began teaching at AUC in 2008, finished her PhD at Johns Hopkins. She has been awarded fellowships from Harvard University and Brown. She was a Fulbright temporarily in Germany. Her research focuses on the intersection of contentious politics and security issues broadly defined. Uh, her book, Social Unrest and American Military Bases in Turkey and Germany since 1945, was published by Cambridge University Press. She also directed and accompanied doc documentary, which actually I'd be interested in seeing. Um, having spent a decade living in the Middle East through the period known as the Arab Spring, she has published numerous articles in various publications in Egypt, Turkey, Bahrain, and the Kurdish regions of Iraq and Syria, and she continues to do fascinating research on the, on the Kurds. Uh, <laughs> In, 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 Iraq, in Syria and, and in Iraq. So and we're delighted to have her at the center. So Amy, without further ado, over to you and Dr. Kareem for what I'm sure is gonna be a incredibly enlightening conversation. All right. Well, thank you for that um, introduction, Erin. Um, I have the honor and pleasure of introducing Dr. Najmaldin Karim, who I'm sure many of you know. Um, he's a well-known figure here in Washington, D.C. He actually um, is, a neuro, is a neurosurgeon uh, by training. He did his residency at George Washington University here in Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> he then actually was a founding member of the Kurdish National Congress of North America, served as its president from 1991 until 1999. Dr. Karim testified before the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee in June 1990 on Saddam Hussein's atrocities against the Kurds. I believe that was six weeks before uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. <laughs> um, he um, then, in 1996, founded the Kurdish, uh, the Washington Kurdish Institute, um, and was then elected twice to the Iraqi Parliament in 2010 and 2014, before becoming governor of Kirkuk until October 2017. 
Um, and I believe this is his first visit to Washington since the uh, referendum. So we are going to begin with um, having Dr. Karim make a few um, opening statements, um, five, seven minutes. I'll have to be very uh, strict in <laughs> monitoring the time. Then I will ask him some questions as moderator, and then we will open it up for questions from the audience. So thank you again, Dr. Karim, for being here. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you, Aaron. I'm delighted to be here again uh, at Wilson Center, and uh, uh, we always cite what President Woodrow Wilson said about self-determination for the Kurds, for the Armenians, etc. Um, as you heard, I've been ordered to speak for five to seven minutes, so uh, I'm going to stick to that. Uh, uh, but I'm really so happy to see so many of you here, and thank you for coming. So it's late in the day, and uh, uh, so many friends, Ambassador. Lukman Fairby, my friend, is here. Dick Knapp. Uh, many, many others who are here. Uh, Catherine Porter. Uh, uh, in five minutes, I don't know where to begin, but I think, uh, uh, you know, this being uh, my first trip out of Kurdistan since the referendum, I thought I would get a little bit more time, but that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, basically, uh, uh, I think this meeting uh, uh, and talking to you all is, is uh, we're going to get to the subjects, uh, uh, you know, in the question and answer and, uh, and the discussion that we have, which is actually the title of the uh, meeting. Uh, basically what happened is uh, uh, I was governor in Kirkuk. Uh, uh, Kirkuk had a had good thing going for it actually during uh, the time I was there. Uh, we started uh, at a rough time when Al Qaeda was still there. American forces were there, and then they they left. Uh, but then we started some work that helped uh, bring the communities together: Kurds, Arabs, Turkmens, different religious groups, uh, sects, and all that. Uh, and and people attest to that. Uh, uh, and people who have come actually since. October 16 of 2017, they see the difference between what Kirkuk is today and what most of other Iraqi cities are, including Basra, Najaf, Karbala, which, uh, which actually, in my opinion, have always been treated much better than Kirkuk. But we were able to work together with the communities in Kirkuk. Uh, of course, when ISIS came to Kirkuk in 2014, uh, after they went through Mosul and Tikrit, those places, uh, we had only one brigade of Peshmerga, but our people, uh, our that brigade of Peshmerga with our local police, which is a mixture of Arabs, Turks, and uh, Turkmens and, Kur uh, and Kurds, we were able to repel ISIS uh, when uh, they were able to go through any place that they were, just like the Mongols did in the in the 10th and 11th century. Uh, we were able to stand them. We were able to protect all the p communities there. Uh, we had hundreds of thousands of refugees come from other places into Kirkuk. Actually, the peak number was about 700,000. They were coming to Kirkuk to be protected, to be able to uh, go on with their lives. The oil fields, that was the major price for ISIS, was protected by the Peshmerga forces, by the forces we had in Kirkuk, and many volunteers. Uh, we gave a high price. A lot of our Peshmerga and security forces were killed defending Kirkuk. Uh, and then, of course, on the other side, there were issues between Kurdistan and between Baghdad. The issues related to the Constitution, uh, Article 140, the hydrocarbon law, the issue of Peshmerga, many others, and actually the person who, uh, who enumerated those violations of the Constitution by the uh, federal authorities in Baghdad was Ambassador Robert Ford. Uh, he mentioned it in the article, in, in, uh, in the way up to the referendum, uh, all the points one by one, and of course, the Kurds were most eager to have a democratic federal Iraq than anybody else and had the most power actually after 2003. And that constitution was written based on that. But then unfortunately, you know, 
there was drifting from the agreement and the constitution, and that's what actually led to the call for the referendum. It wasn't because we wanted to separate and all that. That was the reason the call was made for a referendum. The, for a, the referendum was, was done, supported by over 90% of the people who voted, including the people in the disputed territory. And it wasn't. So, and also in the referendum, there's one important point that people need to, to really know. Uh, everybody, President Barzani, others, and myself in Kirkuk, we have made it clear that this referendum does not draw the borders of Kurdistan. This referendum is not to declare Kurdistan's independent right away, but to get into negotiations about the issues that led us to go with referendum. And maybe if we could resolve these issues, we could have done something else. There were other things to do. Confederation, maybe the, okay, now the Article 140 is going to be implemented. The oil laws and sharing the uh, revenues, doing all the things could have brought us together. But unfortunately, what happened uh, after the referendum, the threats, uh, uh, foreign interfe interference uh, in the internal affairs, particularly from Iraq's eastern neighbor and northern neighbor, uh, led to what happened on October 17. Since then, over 200,000 people have been uh, uh, displaced from Kirkuk. Uh, Kirkuk is nothing like it was before. Uh, Daesh is actually is very active in the areas that were supposed to be uh, controlled by Iraqi security forces. A uh, day doesn't go by where there is no attack uh, on uh, uh, civilians, on uh, security forces in, in Hawija and around Kirkuk itself. I'm going to stop here since my time, I think, is close to being up. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so I, I guess if we could go back, um, first of all, to the larger question of the referendum. Um, I think if you could maybe describe for our audience what, um, you know, what were the goals of the referendum? What did, um, what did Kurds expect to achieve? I mean, there was, there was a very sort of, uh, the, as you mentioned, over 90% uh, voted in favor of the referendum. But if you could just sort of elaborate, what did, um, what, what did you expect sort of to happen? I mean, because many, many people, I think, including the United States, had, had warned about the timing of the referendum, that this was not a good time to do this in September, um, you know, that it would be necessary to wait a little bit. So if you could explain both the timing of the referendum, why did it happen then, um, and what, you know, what did you expect to happen? Because yeah. I think many people were surprised by, by the events that happened then in October, which we'll get to yeah. um, in a minute. Uh, well, uh, what we expected from the referendum is for people to go and express their opinion about what do you want as a Kurd, as a, as a person living in Kurdistan, even not being a, some who are not Kurd who live there, what do you want? What do you, how do you feel about independence or remaining part of Iraq? And that was really it. And we were not expecting to be attacked by tanks, by artillery, uh, our people being forced to leave, uh, all the problems that happened. We were, of course, we were not expecting also uh, that uh, a group of individuals will go make a secret deal with, uh, with the help of uh, a foreign country uh, to make, to ease this. Uh, I want to say one thing here. Uh, I don't think Prime, Prime Minister Abadi, after the referendum, of course, he, he said this is not acceptable, it has to be canceled and all that, but he also made a, a point that we will not use firepower, we will not fight. He said this, but when he saw this agreement made by a neighboring country with elements within the Kurdish political establishment, I think he saw the opportunity and sent the troops uh, with the militias that were uh, that had come there uh, prepared to do this because they knew there was an agreement there. Uh, our referendum was just to give our, our opinion. For example, in Kirkuk, which is a disputed territory, people were asking, well, maybe it shouldn't be done there. Our point was, you know, th 
those people who consider themselves being Kurdistani could could vote for the referendum in diaspora in the United States, in Germany, in all the other countries. The same thing of people in, in Kirkuk, in Tuzhulmatu, in Khanakin have the right to vote for that. Uh, you cannot deprive them because they live there. They live in an area we consider it Kurdistan. Some people may not consider it that, but it's up to them to come to vote. And about, about close to 70%, actually 72% of the people of Kirkuk who, are, who were not only Kurds, but there were Arabs and Turkmen among them, they came and voted for in that referendum. And the vote was over 90% for, yes, we want independent Kurdistan. And it was very peaceful. It was peaceful. It was like a carnival everywhere in Kurdistan. And regarding the question of... Um, timing? Timing, yeah. yeah. Of course, on July 2nd, uh, the timing of the referendum was done with all the political parties in Erbil. I was not part of that meeting myself, but it was with President Barzani, uh, all the major political parties, KDP, PUK, the Islamic parties, the uh, other smaller parties, even Turkmen parties that are in Erbil, in Kirkuk, they were participating in that meeting. Uh, they set the date. Why that date, I really don't know exactly. Of course, on July 2nd, I had the U.S. ambassador come to my residence with vice counsel from Erbil consulate and some others. And we talked about Daesh, about Kirkuk, about all of that. This is July 2nd, so the Daesh was still in Hawija. And it, he, he raised the f question of the referendum. And his point was uh, the referendum should not, it's not a good time to have the referendum. Why it's not a good time? Because Iraq has election coming up. You know, it's obvious they like uh, Prime Minister Abadi to be re-elected, and he made that point. And then if Prime Minister Abadi is Prime Minister, then probably there's somebody who could stand in the way of the Iranians to decrease the Iranian influence. And if Prime Minister Abadi is re-elected and he's prime minister, the Kurds have a better person to negotiate with about independence in the future. And our answer was, I think all that is fine, but why don't give us a time? You tell us what time we should do it instead of just making it an open-ended thing. If, we want us, if you want us to do it after the elections, we're happy to entertain that. And actually, I personally spoken to President Barzani about this, and he was willing to do that. After that, I had another meeting at the airport with the ambassador who were traveling to Vienna, and I was traveling there, and Mr. Uh, ambassador McGurk as well. Uh, and then in Washington, I had a meeting with Ambassador McGurk, with uh, actually, my friend, the um, Iraq's ambassador, at his house with the presence of uh, national security advisor of Iraq, he was there, and Ambassador Fred Yassin, uh, of course. And we talked about this all night. We had dinner, we talked about it, and we, you know, the, the point was, okay, give us a date and we will do it. And then I met him, McGurk, in his office also at the State Department. I met Stuart Jones, the uh, acting Assistant Secretary of State. And when we talked about that, actually the last thing he said, I have a witness with me, said, well, this sounds like a game plan. We give you a date to do it after the elections and all that. That never came, actually. That never came. And and the, like I said, it was not anything to, you know, we were clear that we will not declare independence after this. We will go two years or three years, get into negotiations, and that negotiation may lead to something different than independence, or if we reach a, a deadlock, then that time you can, we can do it. I hope I answered. It was a long answer. But. Um, okay, and could you then, I mean, describe the events um, on October 16th fr from your personal perspective? I mean, what happened to you personally, how you fled Kirkuk, et cetera? Well, I, have, I haven't been uh, out of uh, Kurdistan. This is my first time. Uh, 
because we were all grounded. Uh, we couldn't get out, including him. <laughs> uh, actually, what happened is, of course, after the referendum, uh, President uh, Talabani uh, was taken to, uh, no, before the referendum by a few days, he was taken to Germany. Uh, many of you, you know that he fell ill after a stroke, and he was pretty much disabled the whole time uh, in 2012. Uh, December 17. Uh, the referendum happened. You know, everything really, like I said, it was festive. People were out. All the political parties were in support. And just for those revisionists who say, well, they shouldn't, it shouldn't have been done, it always reminds me of President Kennedy's speech. It says, victory has thousands, thousand fathers, but uh, defeat is an orphan. And that's Actually, I even mentioned that in one of our meetings in Kurdistan prior to the referendum. When President Barzani went to Suli in the rally for the referendum at the stadium, every member of the PUK leadership was present, the Politburo, the Deputy Secretary General, uh, the former First Lady, the fa the family from President Talibani, they were there. The Politburo, everybody was there. I, I was in Kirkuk at that time. When President Talibani is, uh, uh, you know, he died in, in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, and those family members were uh, in Berlin with him, even though there, there was some feud among them, but they all agreed to follow this deal that has been uh, discussed with our next door neighbor. Uh, and the final decision had been made. The President Talibani's uh, body came back to Suri. Uh, delegations from Baghdad, the Foreign Minister of Iran, uh, um, uh, Zarif was, in, was there members of Iraqi parliament, they were over there. He was buried. Uh, and then uh, discussion started again about trying to change the things. You know, U.S. was heavily involved. There was uh, the delegation from the United States, from uh, Britain, uh, represented by the ambassador, uh, Jan Kubisch. Uh, they all went and saw President Barzani in Duhok. And really, there was nothing. Uh, it was all verbal things, you know, if you don't do it now, you can do this, you can do that. And then finally, they wanted something in writing, and they went to the site, found a computer, and wrote something. It was a draft. Uh, it never really had a promise of having a referendum. Uh, it says, we will work on Article 140. We will work on these things in the next two to three years, and hopefully we can do it. And the answer was, well, having the referendum is not going to prevent any of that from happening. Still two to three years negotiation. So you could have the referendum and still do that. Things failed. The last meeting was in Dukan, which is a resort in Suleimania. And in that meeting, they tried to convince uh, some of those who were firm on having the referendum to uh, accept the proposition by the United States and not to do it at that time. Uh, no agreement was reached. Actually, the agreement was whatever we do, we have to do it collectively, which means nobody can go make a side deal with anyone else. That was the agreement that they met in Dukan, and that was uh, what was supposed to be. Uh, they got up. This was Sunday. The uh, uh, Actually, this was, uh, yeah, it was uh, uh, Saturday, the meeting. Uh, the meeting in Dukan. I, I believe it was Sunday, right? No. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so the meeting with President Barzani and the Politburo. No, it was on Sunday morning. We got a warning that at 2 o'clock in the morning, Iraqi forces will come into Kirkuk. Uh, because the agreement was final. Uh, there had been meeting between 
uh, Iranians and PUK members at President Talabani's house. And there has been understanding about what the Peshmergas do with, the, with, with regard to deployment, with regard to fighting, resisting, withdrawing, and all of that. Uh, so we were all in Kirkuk that day on Sunday. Uh, that evening, uh, people were out, all out in the uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, very enthusiastic. Uh, I went and saw them many times, and uh, basically we insisted we don't want to fight, we don't want to get into any fight with anybody, but we also want to protect our people. Uh, we want no interference military interference because this is contrary to the Constitution. The Iraqi Constitution actually says you cannot move military force without approval, without a request from Prime Minister and the President, an approval by the Parliament with two-thirds of the vote, and that's only for a month. Of course, none of that was done. The troops were sent, regular and irregular, mostly irregular troops. Uh, around midnight, uh, uh, we got information that they were moving, and I was warned about, you know, myself and safety. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to get into details of that. Uh, so we moved from place to place, and uh, you know, by seven o'clock in the morning, it was obvious that uh, uh, some units of the Peshmergas uh, of the PUK have been given orders to withdraw and not to fight, and which they did, and. Uh, uh, Iraqi forces, mostly Shia militias, uh, came into the city. Uh, and uh, I left that morning. I stayed in Kirkuk, though, uh, that whole day. Uh, and that was basically what happened. So, I mean, <clears throat> in terms of the big picture, what happened after October 16, the... Um, the airports in Erbil and Suleimani were shut down to international flights. Um, Forty some percent of the territory was was lost. Is that correct? I mean, can you talk about sort of the 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 the, the larger sort of effect on uh, the autonomy of the Kurdistan uh, region of Iraq? I mean, also in terms of controlling the borders, the ability to issue visas. Um, yeah. the, I mean, now the airports have reopened, but I mean, could you sort of which which uh, how did this affect the autonomous powers of the of the KRG? Well, of course, uh, uh, before uh, the referendum, uh, the prime minister uh, issued uh, a statement that the borders, uh, the uh, flights from Erbil and Suleimania airports will be uh, stopped. Uh, so that was done actually. Three, uh, the referendum was on Monday, by on Friday, it went into effect. Uh, and most of the people who were there to observe the referendum, they left. Uh, then there was demand to return to, uh, to the borders of 2003, when Saddam Hussein was in power. Uh, and actually, even further than that, because some places, Peshmergas have been there, for example, in Sheikhan, around al Qush, those places. They were there even in the 90s, Accra, and they wanted all of that. So they really wanted to, uh, to show that they have succeeded and the Kurds have been defeated, <coughs> and they can uh, have the spoils. Uh, but then, of course, things changed, and uh, uh, I think uh, there was more pressure from uh, United States from uh, Britain, from uh, France, from uh, Germany, from European countries. And of course, President Barzani had dec declared before uh, the referendum that he said, when my time is up, because his, his mandate had been extended twice, two years each time, when my mandate expires, uh, I'm not going to be a candidate for president again. I will leave the office. And no one from my family will be a candidate for the president. He made that very clearly. So after the referendum, when the time came, he resigned. Once he resigned, you know, he got a call from Secretary Tillerson and others. You know, they, you know, they uh, basically said what a statesman he was for the benefit of the country, as if he was the cause of all of this. But anyway, 
so the the U.S. came out in a statement supporting the KRG government, uh, the Prime Prime Minister uh, Nechivan Bajani, and his government. Uh, and negotiations started again. The ambassador started coming to Kurdistan. So finally, uh, you know, delegation came from Baghdad because actually, the coalition needs those airports as much as the Kurds need it, because all their work is through that airport, the, the support for the forces, the, uh, you know, their planes land there and they take off from there and uh, all the logistics are through those airports. So they, they really put a lot of pressure on uh, Prime Minister Abadi's government and finally he sent a delegation by, uh, headed by his chief of staff. Uh, they agreed on all the points about reopening the uh, airports and finally, the agreement uh, uh, was signed by uh, by the prime minister. It took a while, but he signed it. Uh, and uh, the authorities were given to the interior minister, uh, who was very cooperative on this, and actually traveled to uh, the airport, as far as I know, is still this, as it was. Yeah, but there is one thing for... Uh, uh, Foreigners who used to come to Kurdistan and get their passports stamped there, now they need to fill out one form uh, and they have to pay a fee. And of course, that goes to Baghdad. And by the way, Iraqi government has always inspected those airports. All the landing and taking off was always under Iraqi, under civil aviation uh, control, C Iraqi civil av aviation control. It wasn't like... Uh, the Kurds have, except for the visa, everything else was uh, under Iraqi government. Actually, the radar that controlled that area for any plane that flew over 20,000, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, meters or feet, uh, was in uh, was in Kirkuk, uh, at the air base in Kirkuk, the, the radar system. It always worked through there. I remember, uh, you know, when... We came, we always, you know, in a private plane, sometimes we go on delegation. We had to take permission from Baghdad to, to land. It wasn't from Erbil or from Suleimania. So it, this thing was exaggerated, you know, to give an excuse uh, to do things. But fortunately, let me just get to, to, the, to the positive side of things. The airport's open. I think negotiations are going on. Uh, I believe the slowness of the progress of the negotiations has everything to do with the upco upcoming Iraqi elections. And I think after that, uh, I'm hoping we will see things go in a different way uh, and for the relationship to improve and hopefully all the outstanding issues to be resolved. Of course, it takes time. Um, so I guess another question I have is regarding this idea that Kirkuk could potentially also be a standalone province. Um, is that, I mean, something that you had, because you had been a proponent of that at one point, and I not, I mean, not just you, but other people, but is that something you still consider viable or feasible, or what? how, how do you see this sort of now being, being resolved, this issue, particularly um, with, with regards to Kirkuk? You know, I think Article 140, which was supposed to deal with Kirkuk and disputed territories, was really put in place in a way that it's very difficult to, uh, uh, you know, that's why it hasn't been implemented since 2005 until now. And in 2016, I was in Washington, in, and I I think I, I may have even met, uh, seen uh, Ambassador Faley, uh, and I said, if we can't implement Article 140, and the Constitution allows you to form a region. Why don't we go ahead and make Kirkuk an independent region by itself with good relations with Baghdad, good relations with, uh, with the Kurdistan region, uh, and let the people decide, the people of Kirkuk, decide to have a governing council, a governor, and do it that way for three years, four years, five years. We've been waiting 12 years, and the Article 140 is not being implemented. So let's find a way that will avoid conflict, this will avoid military uh, standoff and the tragedies that we saw happening actually on October 16. And I was, 
I was attacked by everybody, including my own party, the PUK. KDP followed just as much. Uh, Goran, they followed as much. You know, they, and when I mentioned it to uh, Prime Minister Abadi, actually, uh, he congratulated me on, 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 on he, he said, this, this, this is courageous you're doing this because you know you're going to be smeared by everybody for saying this. Uh, I said, but he said, I can't really come out and support in public because then Basra wants it, uh, the others want it. Uh, that's only in paper, you know, as far as formation of regions and all that. Anybody who tries to go that way, they stop it. It's all going to happen. All right, I have just two final questions, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience, and I'll ask my questions uh, together. So first of all, since 2003, the KDP and the PUK have really been the dominant political parties um, in the Kurdistan region. But now we've seen the growth of new parties and movements like Goran, Komal, the Alliance for Democracy and Justice by Barham Saleh, et cetera. I mean, how do you see these new political parties or movements or alliances? How will they affect the future of the Kurdistan region, particularly um, <clears throat> with the upcoming elections in May? And then my final question is regarding U.S. policy. So John Bolton actually published an article on October 10th 2017, so that was after the referendum, but before the events on October 16, in which he said, and I quote from John Bolton's article, unfortunately, but entirely predictably, our State Department opposed even holding the referendum and firmly rejects Kurdish independence. This policy needs to be reversed immediately, turning U.S. obstructionism into leadership. Kurdish independence efforts did not create regional instability, but instead reflect the unstable reality. So how do you think John Bolton may possibly, <laughs> potentially impact a U.S. policy towards the Kurds and Iraq. Well, uh, we have we have two changes actually, not just John Bolton. We also have a new Secretary of State. Uh, I think uh, I'm not going to. I don't read people's mind, even though I can operate on people's brains, but I <laughs> can't read their minds. Uh, I think I will leave that up. Uh, really, I can't answer that question. Uh, but I, th I agree 100% with what he said. Uh, and I hope uh, uh, he will help to uh, steer this thing with the president in a way that will actually stabilize Iraq. I mean, Iraq is still in danger by extremists. I mean... It's still in danger. We know, I know in our in, in my province, in Kirkuk, nothing happened to those Daesh, and they were all local people. They were all local from, from the same place. They just shaved, changed, and they are there, and they are doing their dirty work even now. So we need, we need, we need to find a solution for this. As far as Kurdistan, the upcoming election, uh, I think... Uh, uh, you know, everybody has a right to form a, a political party or have their own list for the elections. I think uh, uh, Barham Saleh has the right, just like the KDP and PUK. I think Barham Saleh and uh, and particularly the uh, the one they call themselves New Generation. Uh, they. Uh, uh, will take votes from PUK and Goran in the upcoming election. There's no question about it. Uh, I think KDP base is probably more stable than PUK and Goran because you all know about the divisions and uh, different uh, groups within the PUK. Uh, Goran is the same thing. You know, both both sides they have lost their leader. You know. President Talabani and Noshirwan Mustafa, they both passed away. And these things happen after the leader who was so dominant in everything goes with no clear successor. Of course, this is what's happening there. Uh, I think they will get votes, particularly Barham Saleh, because he has been, he's, uh, he's been in the PUK for many years, had very senior positions. Uh, of course, he's not new, by the way, because uh, he, he has had many positions and all that, but uh, but I think uh, he will he will get uh, PUK votes, and uh, I think he will get it mostly in Slimani. Thank you. 
All right, so let's open it up for questions from the audience. And I'd just like to ask that you first identify yourself and then keep it short and make sure that it is a question and not a comment. So, uh, yes. I, yes, uh, Paul Davis. <sighs> Try to keep it short. <laughs> Um, border crossings, airports were closed. Regional governments under the Constitution are supposed to be semi-autonomous. The Kurdish language was um, enshrined as an official language of, of Iraq. Kurdish signs and Kurdish language uh, street signs were pulled down in Kirkuk. Um, my question is, after all of this, and he, also the Hashd al-Shabi came in in violation of Article 9 of the Constitution, after all of this, is there a way to walk all of this back and can the Kurds once again return as full partners in Iraq? Well, thank you for your question. Uh, of, of course, the points you mentioned uh, is, uh, is true. Those things has happened. Uh, by the way, when we uh, raised the Kurdistan flag uh, through a vote by the governing council, which is completely legal, there was a complaint to the Iraqi Supreme Court that this was illegal by a group of uh, Turkmens in the council. Uh, and actually, the Supreme Court said, no, we, we don't. That has nothing to do with it. This is something local. Uh, this was the Supreme Court's decision uh, in Iraq about the flag, which is prohibited in Kirkuk now. It's prohibited, even though that uh, the Supreme Court says that. Uh, I think it's not easy. It's very difficult. There's, there's deep wound. Uh, uh, because after 2003, really the, uh, uh, and I'm I'm not sectarian or uh, racist or anything, but uh, uh, there was this feeling that the Shias and the Kurds have both been victims of Saddam Hussein and his regime and all of that, uh, and they stand together, you know, to build this country and everything. And what happened, the events of. Uh, uh, you know, after the referendum and the events of October 16, uh, has you know created deep wounds and and uh, distrust, and you have we have to rebuild that uh, if we can. I don't know if it could be done or not, but we have to make efforts to do it because it's really in the interest of everybody for the outstanding issues to be resolved peacefully. I mean, nobody is going to gain from war. I mean, now. Uh, you know, Iraqi forces are in Kirkuk. Are the people of Kirkuk happy? Are those people who have come from Basra, from Najaf, from Karbala happy to be there? I don't know. I'm not sure. They, if they are themselves, maybe their families are not happy. Uh, yes. The lady in the middle, um, the white. Hi, Dr. Karim. It's a pleasure to have you here. So the referendum in 2017, it seems to have broken the trust between central government of Iraq and Kurdistan. How do you see the future of Kurdistan? Do you think it will remain still Kurdistan as a semi-autonomous region or it, uh, like central government of Iraq uh, will bring, like try to bring, you know, further into the, its control? Thank you. Well, I think uh, just briefly to answer your question, I think today, today, things are better than it was three months ago or after October 16. So there has been, you know, the dialogue is going on. And like I said, uh, you know, until the elections, I think this thing will remain in a static situation. We will have this uh, situation. But I think after that, we will see which way it goes. As far as Kurdistan region, will it stay or not? Uh, yes, it will stay. I think. I'm sure it will stay. Uh, you cannot turn, turn it back. Uh, if you look at the tragedies that, has, uh, that Iraq has faced, somehow it's related to the Kurdish issue. The Kurdish demands were for language, for studying, and you know, simple cultural things. Government oppressed the Kurds. Then it became autonomy, did not abide by the autonomy law went and made a deal with the Shah of Iran, gave up Iraqi lands. To get that back, he, Saddam Hussein started a war, eight-year war against, uh, uh, against uh, Iran. 
with a million casualties. Then it went bankrupt to get money, attacked Kuwait, and you know what happened after that. I guess the gentleman in the back. <clears throat> And uh, please identify yourself also. Yes, uh, I'm Kawa Dezai from uh, Kurdistan 24. Um, well, I have to make, it, I'll try my best to make it very short, but I need to make a compassion between two pictures for asking the question. For decades during Saddam Hussein regime, there were a lot of demographic change, replacement for Arabian families in Kirkuk instead of and taking out the Kurdish families, which is called by, known by the Ashur Talaf and other families there in Kirkuk. And after uh, October 16th, in, two, in last year, even which it's very known that the militia, uh, the shade militias started the same thing, the same process again, by bringing a lot of Arabian families to Kirkuk again and, and replaced them with the Kurdish families and, took, and take the Kurdish families out. It took decades that the Kurdish leadership were negotiating and trying their best to solve one of the issues in Article 140, which is this. Based on that, in the next upcoming election, next Iraqi government, to what extent that the Kurds can, get, can be succeeded in dealing with this again while the number is increased now? Thank you. Okay, I just want to correct one thing in your... Uh, uh, yes. Uh, it really wasn't the Shias who brought the settlers back into Kirkuk. It was done by the local authority that was put after we left Kirkuk. It wasn't... The okay. Shias, and actually, the ones who were brought back were the ones Saddam Hussein had give them, given them, confiscated Kurdish lands and given it to them. But they left after two thousand three, so they encouraged those people to come back, and they are not even from Shia areas. They are all That's from right. uh, Guer, Shargat, and 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 those places. Just so, uh, but uh, it's it's difficult, you know, uh, that process of. Uh, uh, returning people's lands, drawing the borders back, is called normalization. Uh, I mean, that was going on for a while, but then it really stopped. And in 2014, we used in the Iraqi parliament to have uh, a committee uh, specifically to deal with Article 140. Then uh, in the cabinet, there was a cabinet member who was in charge of implementing Article 140, but in this new government in 2014, that disappeared in both of them. So you could tell there was no intention really of following up on that, which is a constitutional uh, article in the, uh, you know, it's a constitutional thing. And also it's, uh, uh, it is really one issue that's most outstanding than any other issue, you know, because it deals with the territory, it deals with, with justice, you know, uh, which, has, uh, which has been lacking and, uh, uh, Everybody was looking for that, not just Kurds, actually, even others who lived in those areas. Uh, there are Shias in those areas, there are Turkmen in those areas, their lands were taken, and it still hasn't been resolved. Okay. Uh, yes, gentlemen here. Uh, what's the fate of the 200,000 people who left? I mean, if you could uh, talk about that and... Are they blaming anybody? What's um, are they going to be able to go back? Well, most of them are in. Uh, you see, there's one difference between the tragedy this time and the tragedies in the past. In 1975, I was a Peshmerga. When the Algiers Accord on March 6 happened. We left Kurdistan. We became refugees in Iran. We had nowhere to go to. You either go under Saddam Hussein's rule or you go become refugee in Iran. In 1991, when Saddam forces came back and attacked Kurdistan and attacked the Shias in the south and suppressed the revolution and massacres that has happened, people, all they had were the mountains. We, you were here. You, we saw them all. Uh, probably close to 2 million people. This time, it was different. These people have gone into Awliyar, into Sleimani, into other places that are safer under uh, uh, Kurdistan regional uh, government authorities. But still, when you leave your house, when you leave 
you are forced to do it, even from one neighborhood to the other, it's not right. Uh, we're hoping that eventually things will get back to normal. Uh, the forces in Kirkuk will be the uh, regular forces that we had before. Uh, I'm talking even before 2014. Just make it like that. Not, uh, that's okay. Uh, if you do that, I think people will return. People want to go to, back to their homes. Actually, during the ISIS attack, uh, some of you might know that on October 21st, 2016, there was a major ISIS attack on Kirkuk. Uh, 100 people infiltrated into the city and they attacked different neighborhoods. Actually, they were like probably 15 meters from the governor building where I was. But our people came and just wiped them out, even though we had casualties. And no one left the city. Actually, Kirkukis who were outside the city came to Kirkuk to defend the city. People of Kirkuk are resilient. They don't want to do that. But this time it happened, and I'm hoping eventually we can find a way to get them back. Yes, um, my name is Brian Marshall. I'm not up to date on this matter, but at the same time I do recall that there was a dispute on control of oil resources in Kirkuk. Could you give us an up -to -date, uh, update on that? Yeah. Well, the uh, oil of Kirkuk was, uh, until 2014, uh, was run by North Oil Company, which also had actually theoretically had Mosul and Tikrit, you know, those places, because it's north, so it involves, but 90% of its oil is Kirkuk, actually. I don't know why they call it North Oil Company. It should be called Kirkuk Oil Company, which, which actually we passed a law in our governing council to do that, but uh, they didn't implement it from Baghdad. Uh, so in 2014, when ISIS came, they came to take Kirkuk and its oil. And I think probably the countries that are now shedding, shedding tears probably would have negotiated with, uh, uh, with ISIS to buy that oil on cheap. Uh, but, uh, but, but the Peshmergas were able to uh, repel them. And uh, uh, right after October 17, the Iraqi forces has come back. Now the whole oil, oil of Kirkuk is again under the North Oil Company and the Ministry uh, of interior. But on, on oil issue, it's not just the Kurds who are complaining. Basra is complaining. Every province that's producing oil and energy, they are complaining because we're not getting what the Constitution says, that the decision has been made with the region, with the governorates. This is in the Constitution. It has to be worked together, but they never consult. I mean, what is it? That, uh, these are the problems with the with, with, uh, uh, with running the things in Iraq, that the Constitution is just there, but we're really not doing anything. And I'm not saying it's all Baghdad. We have, in Kurdistan, there has been some, uh, some points on that as well. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more questions, and I'm going to use my prerogative as moderator to also ask one last question. Um, Okay, I'll go ahead and ask um, if you could talk us talk to us, or I'd be curious to hear your your thoughts on the situation um, with the Syrian Kurds. If you could share your thoughts on the recent developments there and their sort of form of local council autonomy that they've been trying to establish um, in in Syria. If you could make any comparisons between the situation um, in Iraq. Well, there is some parallel, you know, because United States uh, is. Uh, friends or, you know, they deal with the Kurds, with Iraq and with Syria. Uh, sometimes they call them our allies. Sometimes they say we're not there, so they are alone. We have nothing to do with them, and that's really what happened in Afrin in Syria. Uh, the Kurds of Syria has been the only fighting force that, has, that was able to fight ISIS and expel them from significant areas, including an all of northeast uh, Syria, from Kamishlu to Shaddadi to uh, Hasaka, then down to Deir and eventually uh, Raqqa. They did all of that. They uh, 
were very disciplined force. Uh, you know, men and women were fighting. Uh, and everybody was boasting how great these people are. Even in the presidential debates, you all remember how Kurds were described as the best thing after uh, you figured it out. Uh, and then, of course, what we saw, uh, Erdogan has been, uh, who actually, uh, Turkey has been allowing jihadists from all over the world to go through its land to Syria to do a lot of bad things. I remember when Kobani was under severe attack, people in Turkey were saying, oh, it's a, just a matter of days, two, three days, it will fall. Well, they, they, they resisted hero heroically and they were able to uh, actually, that's when they got support they, because they saw them resisting so well. That's when United States and coalition started uh, to help them, not before that. You probably, uh, Amy, you, you're very familiar with Syria. And of course, what we saw happen in Afrin was really a tragedy uh, and a letdown uh, by U.S. as far as the Kurds are concerned. Uh, because the, peop the, the people who were fighting in Deir Zur, in Raqqa and all that, had a lot of people who were residents of Afrin. It's just Afrin has been the most quiet, coexisting city, you know, with over three, four hundred thousand IDPs from other parts of Syria in Afrin who were all Arabs, actually, because Afrin itself is about 95, 98% Kurdish. They left them by themselves. Russia, I think, took revenge on the Kurds because they were so close to the Americans, doing American bid, as they, they claim. And they allowed the, air, the airspace to be used by Turkey. They allowed uh, their forces to withdraw from there. That was a buffer, just like we have in Menbij now with the Americans. They were Russians in, in Afrin. And we saw what happened in Afrin. Again, 200,000 people uh, deported from there. Uh, their homes were looted. And these were, they call them Free Syrian Army, but they're all jihadists, terrorists. They, they you know, they cause all kind of atrocity wherever they have been. And these are people, the United States, very quickly realize they are good for nothing, even though they spend, uh, I believe, $500 million trying to train them to do something, and they realize that uh, they're not good for anything except for uh, looting and stealing and killing people. I mean, the reports you could see, you read about this. Uh, I, I'm really afraid for the people of, uh, uh, of uh, Syrian Kurdistan because uh, we don't know what's going to happen, and uh, and there are some actually who believe that they should go and make a deal with uh, uh, with the Syrian regime. Do we want the same Syrian regime to control all of Syria like this again? I don't think so. Uh, as far as the administration that they have, from what I know and from what I read and what I have seen, people from uh, Syrian Kurdistan come. Uh, and visit me when I was in Kirkuk and even now uh, in Erbil. Uh, I think what's, what you see in the mixed areas where majority are Arabs, the councils they have created are majority Arabs. Uh, uh, everybody is participating in it. Actually, women have been empowered the most in all of Middle East in that part uh, than anywhere else in the Middle East and maybe for that matter in a lot of other countries countries, including uh, uh, develop, developed or Western countries. Uh, I mean, you could see uh, there's every position, there's a woman and, and a man. And believe me, the woman has a say. It's not like the Iraqi parliament when, uh, when everybody follows their party and all that. It's re it really is they have a say. So I, I'm really concerned about it. And bad things can happen. But I hope I'm wrong on this. One thing I, I want to say that uh, Pompeo had some not nice words about uh, uh, Turkey when he was a congressman. What kind of a regime is it, it is? Where is it heading? And Turkey is unfortunate because Turkey is really a great country. It's a big country. It's it's beautiful country, but it's going the wrong way, you know, it's going the wrong way. Journalists are put in jail. There are over 60,000 people lost their jobs. Uh, actually, 150,000, 60,000 have been just 
uh, dismissed from their jobs, you know, uh, put in jail, parliamentarians, there are now 13 Kurdish parliamentarians who are in prison in Turkey, uh, their immunity is uh, revoked, uh, they are sentenced long sentences, uh, you know, people are put in jail for tweets, for, for simple things, uh, that's taken for granted. I think to Turkey, democracy in Turkey is going the wrong way. It's not just the Kur it's not just a Kurdish issue in Turkey. It's it's really issue of democracy for the whole people in Turkey and for the region. All right, we have time for one last question. Yes. Hi, my name is Adam Friend. I'm a student at Georgetown University. Um, you spoke already about the uh, Iraqi elections coming up next month. Uh, I also wanted to hear your expectations for the uh, regional and Kurdish elections that I believe are coming now in December. Uh, so what do you expect in regards to the division between more established parties and these newer upcoming parties, uh, particularly around Kurdistan and in Kirkuk? Thank you. Yeah. Well, the Kurdistan election is supposed to be in actually in uh, September. Iraqi provincial elections will be in uh, December. Uh, I think we will see signs of what happens in those elections after the Iraqi election for the parliament. Because I think if some of these parties get together with, as far as uh, what their position will be in Baghdad, who they will support in Baghdad, whether uh, Prime Minister Abadi will become Prime Minister again or somebody else becomes Prime Minister again and how they, they deal with them, I think that will shape the future relations uh, and how the elections in Iraqi uh, Kurdistan, in the provincial elections, will, uh, which way it will go. But definitely there will be new faces. Uh, like I said before, I think, uh, uh, I think some political parties will not have the same force and representation in Iraqi parliament or in Kurdistan parliament as we see it today. All right, thank you everyone for coming out um, and please join me in thanking Dr. Karim. Thank you very much, thank you. <laughs>